Hey booktube! Today I want to tell you about some of my favorite books that I have read so far in uh, 2020. Uh, since we are about halfway through the year now, I figured I would go ahead and make a video of some of my top books thus far. Um, I have six here. There are three fiction and three non-fiction books. Um, and of course, these could change over the course of the next several months. Um, but as of right now, these are my sort of top favorites in fiction and nonfiction categories. Um, one of the books in the nonfiction category was a library book, and I don't have that with me. I returned it, so I won't have anything to hold up for that book. But I have physical copies of all of the other books because I own all of them. And so I'm just going to go through them um, in this video and tell you a little bit about them and why I like them. So we'll start with the fiction books first and I'm going to go in uh, order from like third favorite to first favorite. So in terms of fiction, my first favorite or my third favorite book rather was The Way We Live Now by Anthony Trollope. This was a book that we read as part of uh, Steve Donahue's uh, Consorting with Lonely Trollops read-along that he's been doing um, each month um, in 2020. And so far of the Trollops we have read, this has been my absolute favorite. Uh, this is just such an excellent book. And of course, as Steve talked about in some of his videos when he was uh, when we were doing this read-along, he was saying how this isn't your typical Trollope book. Um, it's not as sort of um, out of lighthearted is the right word, but Trollope is more biting and more angry in this book. And so it's different from all the rest of his novels that he has written um, because he comes back from visiting the colonies and he's absolutely horrified by uh, what he has seen in England at that time period. And so Trollope sits down and writes this book and it's very satirical in terms of all the things that were happening, happening in England at the time from politics to finance to the aristocracy. All of, all of those different things. And so, of course, we follow several different characters in this book. Um, there's Lady Carberry, who is completely false. You learn that from the very beginning. There is her son, um, Felix, who is a gambler, and he is using up all of their money and just... He's a terrible son, essentially. And then... The worst of the worst is Melmot, who is uh, a swindler, and he is this big name in London, but he's basically just not a nice guy. Um, and so the whole cast of characters in this book are just full of satire, and Trollope is definitely making a point with this book that uh, you don't necessarily see in his other works as much because this is so biting and so angry in so many places. Um, and I just really enjoyed it. Definitely my favorite Trollope thus far. My second favorite book for the fiction category is The Watchmaker of Filigree Street by Natasha Pulley. And I read this, I think, in like January or February, and I just fell in love with it. Um, I couldn't put it down. Essentially, this is set in the 1800s in England, and it follows Nathaniel Steepleton, um, who he finds a gold pocket watch on his pillow when he comes home one day. And six months later, this pocket watch ends up saving his life, um, drawing him away from a blast that destroys Scotland Yard. And so when he goes in search of the watch's maker, he ends up meeting... Kita Mori, um, who is from Japan. He's an immigrant. And this leads to a string of unexplainable events and all kinds of things that happen. And then also Kita, or not, yeah, Kita and Nathaniel are both gay. And so there's the LGBTQ aspect in this book as well. 
um, that they are end up in a relationship. Um, and so this is just a lovely book. It's got that magical realism feel to it as well as, you know, just that you're steeped in the whole London in the 1880s and it's, it's wonderful. So wonderful. Um, unfortunately, I'm still reading the sequel to this book, um, The Lost Future of Pepper Harrow, and I don't know what my problem is with that book. I just can't get into it. It's not pulling me in like this one did. I don't know if it's because, sadly enough, it sounds horrible, I don't know if it's because it's mostly taking place in Japan and that setting just doesn't do it for me like England does. I, I don't know. Like I said, that sounds just absolutely awful to say, but there is something about that book that's just not drawing me in. And I desperately want to finish it so I can stop, like, holding it up in every currently reading video. But I just can't... I, I, I don't know. But this one definitely was one of my favorites. And not only that, but the cover is amazing. And then you see the circle here with the, the clock. And if you open it, then there's the pocket watch. So that was my, that's my second favorite book so far this year. And then my first favorite book will come as no surprise if you've watched uh, any of my other videos, especially the one where I talk about um, being part of Indies Introduce. And that is Freshwater for Flowers by Valerie Perrin. I love this book so, so much. Um, I found out that the release date is actually pushed back a little bit. It will come out on July 7th. Um, but, because I, I had originally said in that video that it came out in um, June. But it's been pushed back, probably because of COVID, go figure, um, to July 7th. And I can't wait to get an actual, like, pretty hard copy of this, um, rather than this uh, advanced reader's copy, even though I will hang on to this copy because... It has nostalgia factor for me, but this is just a beautiful book. It follows Violet, who is a caretaker of a cemetery in a small town in France, and her, um, she ends up in, intertwined with this local police officer who comes by, his name's Julian Sorrel, and he wants to uh, sprinkle the ashes of his dead mother on the grave of her one-time lover and when him and Violet start talking they realize that they're intertwined in various ways through this this dead mother's lover and it's just such a great book and oh, I love it so much it's just it's so heartwarming and beautiful and it's so well written, and I, I could gush about it with all kinds of, <laughs> of platitudes that don't really say much about it, but it, it's so good. So good. So when, I, when it comes out in July, I encourage everybody to pick this up because it is absolutely amazing, and I just love it. It's just one of the best books, and if it doesn't end up as my number one book for 2020, uh, I will be absolutely amazed because, yeah, this book has my heart in so many ways. Okay, so that is the three fiction books so far. Um, we're going to move into the nonfiction books now. Um, and the third uh, favorite of my nonfiction books is Fatal Discord, uh, Rasmus Luther and the Fight for the Western Mind by Michael Massing. This is a beast of a book. Um, but... This is really, really fascinating. There's so much information in here. Um, and essentially, uh, Michael Massing is looking at two figures from history. Martin Luther, who was the father of the Protestant Reformation. And then also Erasmus, who was uh, a humanist. And he looks at how their lives intersect um, and the ways in which they agreed and disagreed about uh, events that were happening in their lifetime. Um, and so he sort of jumps back and forth between talking about Luther and then talking about Erasmus and their lives. Um, it's part biography and then also just part um, 
looking at their tumultuous relationship um, because they started out sort of agreeing with each other and then ended up not really liking each other by the time it was all said and done. And like I said, there's a lot more to this book than what I'm saying right now, but it is still just absolutely fascinating. And I really, really liked it, especially given my interest in the Reformation and in Martin Luther. I have said in previous videos that I was raised Lutheran, um, ELCA, and so I've always had a fascination with Martin Luther, and I enjoy reading about anything uh, that has to do with religion and the Reformation, um, even though I'm not religious anymore, and this book just scratched that itch for me. Um, and also, it's been interesting to read more about Erasmus because he was a figure I didn't really know much about or even know about until very recently. And so, yeah, this was definitely a great read and I highly recommend it if you're into um, reading more about these two figures and, of course, you know, the Reformation and all the things that were going on during uh, the life of these two intellectual figures. Um, and then my second favorite book um, for nonfiction is The Undertaking, Life Studies from the Dismal Trade by Thomas Lynch. And I talked about this book before, how um, a colleague of mine was getting rid of it because she had ordered it. And then for some reason, she realized that it wasn't what she was wanting for whatever she was doing. And so she wanted to get rid of it. And I took it thinking that, you know, whatever, I'll see what it, what it's about. And I ended up really enjoying it. Um, if you're not familiar, Thomas Lynch is actually a poet, and I haven't really read any of his poetry. But he's also, in addition to being a poet, he's also an undertaker. Um, and so he, in this book, he sort of meditates on his uh, life as an undertaker in a small town. Well, I guess he's the funeral director, but undertaker, same thing. Um, so he sort of meditates on his job as the funeral director undertaker in this small town. Um, and he writes a whole collection of essays that look at this job and at death and even at how, you know, the living process death. When someone who we are close to dies, you know, the rituals we go through in terms of mourning, right? Having a funeral, burying them, um, you know, picking out the coffin, writing the obituary, or cremating them, or whatever the case may be, right? And so, I don't know, I feel like this book in a lot of ways for me was sort of a catharsis, um, because in June of last year, um, one of my uh, most important people from my childhood passed away unexpectedly after complications from surgery for esophagus cancer. And I'm not going to talk about it too much because I will cry, but I feel like reading this book was just, it had healing properties for me because it, I read it as I was still grieving and I still am grieving. And grief was something that I didn't really think Think about until this person passed away. I mean, I had lost people before, but you know, they were my grandparents and they were in their 80s and they were, you know, elderly and they were in the nursing home. And this person that I lost last June was only 61. And, you know, she was younger than my, my own parents. And so that just like threw this whole, whole idea of mortality and also grief into a, into a brighter, light in my life um, in terms of, you know, me thinking about those things. And I feel like this book was, like I said, a catharsis in that it helped me to process death and the way we, as those who are left behind when someone we love dies, um, deal with our grief. Um, and as Thomas Lynch says in here, something that's always stuck out to me um, is that, uh, like having a funeral or a wake or whatever, it isn't for the dead. It's for the living. Um, the dead don't care, essentially. Um, you know, they they probably wouldn't like the big to-do that's made over them when they die, 
Um, and so the, the rituals that we go through when a loved one passes away are for those of us who are still left behind without them. And so this was just a very healing book for me to read um, at this point in my life um, as I continue my own journey with grief. Um, and I highly, highly recommend this. It was actually a National Book Award finalist, which is pretty awesome because it totally deserves that recognition. Um, so yeah, The Undertaking by Thomas Lynch. And then my first favorite book of uh, the nonfiction category is the library book that I no longer have because I returned it. And that is The Other Madisons, A Lost History of a President's Black Family by Betty Kearse. And I have talked about this book in a uh, currently reading video where uh, this book, Betty, is actually a descendant of slaves who were um, possibly fathered by James Madison, um, the, the president. And so in this book, uh, Betty goes and explores her descendants and her history and, you know, how uh, Madison's course plays into her own life. And so it was interesting to read not only about her, her uh, I guess, relationship to Madison and how, like, even though it their background is terrible in that, you know, she's the descendant of people who were slaves to this president. It was also a point of pride in her family. Her mother would always be like, remember, you're a Madison. Um, and so you're the descendant of a pre president. And so while their heritage was so unpleasant, you know, and not not something that you would necessarily see as being proud uh, being a thing to be proud of uh that there was you know the president owned slaves and he uh had relations with them and then had children with them um but yet they they saw it as a point of pride that they were descendants from this president if that makes any sense at all um anyway and so Betty Curse's mother actually sort of said, okay, you're, 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 you are the storyteller of our family's history. And they have a word for it, and I can't remember what that word is now. Um, I wish I would have kept the book. But <laughs> anyway, um, and she, so Betty felt like she had to go and write down what uh, she found out about her ancestors and about her family's history and create this book. So that way she could do her part as the uh, sort of historian or storyteller of her family. And it was just a great read, fascinating, heartbreaking, um, and I thoroughly enjoyed it. I would highly recommend it to anyone who uh, is interested in any of those things, you know, presidents, race, slavery, any of that, especially uh, in our current climate. Um, I'm not going to get into all of that right now because I don't have coherent thoughts. But anyway, um, that was that's so far my number one favorite nonfiction book of this year. And I would highly, highly recommend it to anyone who thinks it sounds interesting. Anyway. Let me know what some of your favorite books have been this year down in the comments, and I will talk to you again soon. Thanks, BookTube!